Well, welcome, everybody, to another segment, uh, again, of Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck. And, of course, as always, that means some very smart talk radio is in your future. In this segment, uh, we're very pleased to have with us Dawn Lerman. She is a board-certified nutrition expert and contributor to the New York Times Well Blog. Her company, Magnificent Mommies, provides nutrition education to students, teachers, and corporations. She lives in New York City with her two beloved children, Dylan and Sophia, we're going to be talking about a, a work that she has put out, a fascinating, fun one called My Fat Dad, A Memoir of Food, Love, and Starvation. Don, how are you, my friend? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. I'm good. You know, do you, are, you, are you ever not happy? Am I ever not happy? Yeah. There's definitely some days. Last night I was coming back from Canada and my plane was delayed. And I had no food for like five hours. I was starving. I was not happy. Okay. <laughs> Didn't even have peanuts or anything on the airplane, huh? There was no. I wasn't on the plane. I was in the airport, like oh. waiting. Oh boy. Yep. That uh, people spend a lot of their lifetime waiting around in airport uh, waiting areas. There's no question about that. Well, let's talk about my fat dad. Uh, interesting story. Your father was in advertising. Uh, you were raised uh, in the where were you? You were raised in the Northeast. Is that right? I was raised in Manhattan. Well, up yeah. until I was nine years old, I lived in Chicago. And then when I was nine, my dad got a huge job as creative director at the McCann Erickson Agency in Manhattan. Uh-huh. So we moved away um, from our hometown of Chicago, where, I, where my grandmother also lived, to New York. So he would have come in just about the time Don Draper left. Exactly. <laughs> but, yeah, he was in that whole Madman era. He was at Leo Burnett in Chicago. He yeah. was really a part of that, like, Madman, you know, culture. Yeah, indeed. Well, let's talk about My Fat Dad. Uh, it's called A Memoir of Food, Love, and Family with Recipes. Uh, a, I, we, I can guess the inspiration, but tell us about that. <laughs> and uh, tell us, uh, it was sort of, is it a work, is it a retrospective, or is it, uh, just tell us. It's a memoir. It's a coming-of-age memoir about growing up in a very, you know, dysfunctional family around food, among other things. Um, but growing up, my dad was 450 pounds, um, and every week he was on a new new fad diet. One week it was Weight Watchers, one week it was Pritikin, one week it was the tapeworm diet, one week it was the cabbage soup diet, um, one week it was, you know, it was the Elvis diet, which meant we didn't get food all day. <laughs> uh, and whatever diet my dad was on, we had to be on to help keep him inspired. How was your uh, was your mother supportive of this, or was this one of those things where, when he would announce a new diet, she would sort of roll her eyes? Yeah, she would just roll her eyes, and she was busy doing her own thing. She was trying to be an actress, and she wasn't around much. And she's, you know, she basically she had no interest in food. She thought one can of tuna fish a day was, you know, a, you know, was enough. And <laughs> she she didn't realize like that growing kids need like three meals a day. They need snacks. They get hungry. You know, she was just too busy like if she couldn't prepare it in under 10 seconds like cold spaghettios like in the car was you know as much as she could handle well advertising everybody knows this especially at that level uh it is incredibly stressful there are lots of very very yes. talented creative people and they're all probably at some level ac or add and a little bit obsessive compulsive so that lends that itself true. to that <laughs> for sure but uh so i'm curious so is dad gone a lot or is dad around a bunch i would think he would be gone was, all the time. He was pretty much gone a lot, but when he was home, it was all about the diet. You know, he came in, guess what? I just discovered, have you guys, you know, read about the uh, AIDS candy diet? And he'd bring like <laughs> thousands of bags of like, you know, AIDS candy, and he'd be like, look, we can eat candy all day. <laughs> <laughs> So, so everything he did was, you know, with like, with tons of exuberance, tons of excitement, you know, and everyone, you know, you know, he was like got everyone on board. You know, he was an ad guy. You know, whatever he was doing, he was selling to us. Well, what kind of a? I'm curious, what kind of a? And you, I was only like, you know, six years old this time. So, you know, what did right, I know? Right. And <laughs> you, you were know? looking at him, and then you'd look at mom, and then you'd look back at him, and kind of trying to figure it all out. So again, you said your mom was satisfied with a with a can of tuna fish, and thinking, wow, that ought to be plenty for somebody. But in, in realistically, was she a good cook? My mother never cooked it ever. I never. see. Nothing. I see. Was it but just her dad? mother, my grandmother Beauty, was the most amazing cook. And I used to go to her house on the weekends, and that's where my passion for cooking and good food, you know, came about. So tell us, did you have siblings? I had a sister. Um, my sister was 
five years younger than me. Um, but when we lived in Chicago, I was I lived there till I was nine. So my sister was just you know a little kid. But we used to go to my grandmother's on the weekends, and she would cook for me. Um, and then she'd give me you know some little snacks that you know, that I could keep in my room for like the week. I'd have like you know little bundle bread and cookies to snack on. She'd be like, "You just pull these out. Don't show them to your daddy because he'll eat them. So you have to hide them in your drawer." So like. <laughs> You know, so I had to hide. Every, I had to hide everything. Well, I, did you live in downtown Chicago? Or did you live out of the suburbs somewhere? No, we we always lived in the city. We lived right on Lakeshore Drive, um, right in the heart of you know, right in the heart of Chicago. If you just joined, we, <laughs> go ahead, keep going. And then we moved to New York, and we lived in the heart of Manhattan, right by Grand Central Station. Oh, so wow. I always lived in big cities. Wow, and not ever very far from some really good restaurants too. No, and we did good with some of them. I mean, there was plenty of times where my dad was off a diet, and you know, some days we and we would go and we would eat. So he was either on or off. You know, there was there was no you know there was no happy medium. It was all about like extremes. If you just joined us, we're talking to nutritionist and author uh, Don Lerman, a brand new work called "My Fat Dad: A Memoir of Food, Love, and Family with Recipes." Uh, so through all of this, when you finally got out on your own, went away to school, uh, and were sort of taking care of yourself, what were your food habits? Uh, well, I started taking care of myself. By the time we moved to New York when I was nine years old, my grandmother used to send me a recipe card every week with a $20 bill because she was scared, like, once we moved away from her that I would die. So, before, you know, she, she always taught me how to cook, and she's like... Here's a, I'm going to send you every week a recipe card with a $20 bill. That way, if I'm making chicken soup for Papa, you can make chicken soup for April, my little sister. If I'm making brisket for Papa, you can make brisket for April. So from the time I was nine years old, I cooked everything for myself. Wow. Okay, so let me ask you something. It, just growing up as a result of all this, what were your favorite foods coming out of, let's just say, by the time you're 18 years old, headed out on your own, what were your favorite foods? For sure, chicken soup, <laughs> um, brisket. I mean, I, I really loved all the traditional foods that kind of kept me connected to my grandmother. But then I started cooking, the, you know, doing my own variations. I was in Manhattan, so I started doing, you know, my gr grandmother's beef stew would turn into like a beef curry. Um, yeah, so I started doing all kinds of like variations on classic um, traditional dishes. But I, I liked you know, traditional foods. I, I'm a, I'm a, I love to eat. And I've never been overweight because I've always made my food fresh, you know. Meats, lean meats, vegetables, fruits, and nothing processed ever. I've never, I don't eat out of a can. I don't eat anything that's frozen. Everything the way my mother ate is the way I rebel against. And she rebelled against her mother, who made everything fresh. And, you know, she was all about fast and convenience. Well, was if watching your father in the advertising industry, was that something that you were drawn to at all, or were you repulsed by it, so to speak? And uh, and I can understand, I guess, how you hopped into the food business, but what about advertising as a career? No, I was very drawn to it. I Actually, I majored, I went to Syracuse, and I majored in communications, and I thought um, I thought I would go into some kind of, well, I, I originally um, went into TV production, and then I worked in advertising for a little while as a producer. Um, but then many years later, then I went into documentary filmmaking. Then I went into, then I got a master's in drama therapy because I really love working with people and helping people. And it wasn't until my dad got cancer and my son was two years old that I went back to school for nutrition. Um, my dad got a stage three cancer diagnosis and they said he had a very small percent. And I had always known about that. I've been, you know, since I've been like 11 years old, I've been going to health food stores. I've been reading every single book imaginable, and I knew I knew there was something more than what the doctors were saying. So I went and studied everything I could, and lo and behold, my dad is 230 pounds and vegan and very healthy. Wow. What about uh, how did your Jewish heritage and, and all of that environment? How did that affect who you are and everything from how you write and how you and how you think about food? Well, everything about all my feelings about food comes from my grandmother's kitchen. As a nutritionist, people are always like, what should I eat? I just heard gluten was bad. What should I eat? I just heard, you know, I should be taking, uh, you know, these supplements. And, and, and while all this information is really good and I read everything, I, I usually make my clients stop and close their eyes. And I'll have you do this. Close your eyes for two seconds and think about your favorite food. Okay. Who were you with the first time you tasted it? Okay. And now when you were thinking about the food and, like, smelling it and tasting it, were you thinking about the calories, if it was trendy, or were you thinking about the person you were with? Uh, uh, thinking about the person I was with. 
So that's what I tell clients. It's not about any particular trend of diet. It's about connecting to memories that make you feel good because food is supposed to nourish you. It's not about deprivation. Did you and your father, uh, what kind of things, and again, he wasn't around much, obviously. He was working a lot. But what kind of things, what kind of time did you spend together and what did you do? We cooked. We made Weight Watchers cheesecakes. We made all kinds of smoothies before they were trendy. Uh, we went to the flea market, and we were always buying concoctions, new kinds of blenders and meat grinders and bread machines. Like, every day was, like, a new possibility of, like, the next big diet. You know, it was never about, like, being healthy. It was like, let's create the next big diet. Let's be, you know, the, let's be, like, the people that come up with something better than Weight Watchers. But our diet is going to be really delicious because we're going to have unlimited amount of like milkshakes and we like throw things into the blender spinach and chocolate and ice and like milk and basically anything in the kitchen counter and you'd be like this is the best diet because we could just like keep drinking and drinking and drinking and if you drink you're not going to get fat i'd be like yeah i mean one of my favorite conversations it was it's one of my most distinct memories i was about three years old i was sitting on the kitchen counter you know my legs dangling trying to see what my dad was doing he's like do you know what would make the better world a better place i'm like no, I don't. He's like, a world without calories. I'm like, huh. He's like, think about that. <laughs> and that was something that always stayed with me. I'm like, huh, a world without calories. Of course, I had no idea what a calorie was. Um, but so when I'm with clients and they're like, should I think about calories? I'm like, no. You know, think about food that nourishes you, food that is fresh, and food that's you know, alive and keep you vibrant and healthy. You know, to me, it's not about the calories. It's not about deprivation. It, you know, it's about nourishing yourself. In general, Don, was your father a pretty happy guy? Oh, yeah. My dad, you know, he was an ad guy. It was always like, you know, it was a slogan a day. He was, you know, he came up with the tab dance after he spent six months at Duke University where he went um, when he was working at McCann there. Um, he he got a sign saying, you know, some big accounts, Coca-Cola, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and they're like, we love your writing, but you can't present looking like this. You know, people are going to think, you know, our products make you look like this. So they <laughs> sent him to Duke University to the fat farm for six months, and he went down to 175 pounds. When he entered the fat farm, he was 350 and he came out at 175 pounds. So did looking and feeling obviously a whole lot better at 175, was that enough to help him? Was that the one thing once and for all he finally decided to keep it off, or did he bounce back up again? Nope. He said, six minutes to lose, six minutes. I mean, six months to lose, six minutes to gain. No, he went back. I mean, he never went back up to like 450. He went up to about 300 pounds. But he was oh, everything was always about extremes for him. Even now, he's very healthy and he's vegan, but it's very extreme. There's no, you know, there's no, no, there's no varying from it. You know, everything has to be like breakfast is this, lunch is this, dinner is this. You know, it's all, it's very, everything is very regimented. But yeah, he's always been a very happy go lucky guy. You know, go lucky guy. And when he came back from the fat farm, he uh, came up for with the slogan for tab called the tab dance. It keeps you light on your feet. <laughs> right. So he was always, you know, he always had a, he had a, a slogan a day. He always had a slogan. He was always in good spirits. You know, there was always possibility. You know, there was it was never like, oh, I'm heavy, I'm poor me. You know, he made jokes about it. You know, he was fat Al. Everyone knew him. He was fat Al. He was funny. You know, he was lively. You know, he was never down. Well, everybody uh, is aware of your work with with food and nutrition, and I'm just curious as to what was the trigger event, Don, that that you said, you know what, I want to put this all down as a memoir. The trigger event was it, actually it did not start as a memoir; it started as a recipe book. When on my daughter's first day of preschool, I had always, you know, I made my own baby food, I made my own cookies, I made everything from scratch, and my daughter was always like the sweetest, happiest, you know, well-behaved girl. The first day of preschool, I picked her up. She's like rolling on the floor. She's crying. I notice all the other kids are crying, and then they're all run to the icy truck. I'm like, what is going on? They, like, during the course of the day, they fed him, like, so much sugar, you know, and all kinds of snacks with, like, artificial food dyes, and these kids were bouncing off the wall. And, I'm, and I was talking to other parents, and they just seemed so unaware of the connection between, like, food and behavior. So I decided to set out a, to write a book called Snacking Outside the Box, and it was basically what to bring your kid at 3 o'clock to stabilize their mood. And then I started writing down all my grandmother's recipes, and then in writing the recipes, I realized there is no recipe without a story or a memory. So then I started recording my stories and memories, and then I, my blog, and then wrote a blog, and then my blog got picked up by the Well Blog of the New York Times, and I started sharing 
my stories there. And then I got letters from hundreds of people all over the world sharing their stories about, you know, their Italian grandmother and their lasagna. And then that just inspired me, and I started writing my story. Do you think uh, Do you think your audience is comprised primarily of whom? Baby boomers or Gen Xers, or is it all over the place? It is all over the place. I have letters from girls who are 12 years old. I have uh, letters from, like, girls in China who are in their 20s. I have women in Florida, you know, in their 80s. I, get, I have men, you know, who are writing about, you know, their struggles. Uh, it really, it really runs the gamut, which I was really surprised. I thought it would be like mostly, you know, older women, but it's young girls, it's older men, it's middle-aged men, it's pretty much everybody because everybody eats and everyone has a memory and a story about food. So I think, so this is my fat dad is my story, but it becomes a lot of other people's stories as they read it. So when you ran the title by the old man, what do you think? He loved it because he always called himself Fat Dad. Okay, okay. I mean, and he actually he started his own advertising agency, and he had a pic- picture of himself. It was even, you know, it was, it was like really exaggerated. It was a cartoon. It said, you know, to be to be a big agency is good. To be uh, big, you know, and bold is even better. So he always used himself and his weight as you know, like he marketed it. He used it. Got it. Got it. What about, uh, and again, it's a memoir, but there are recipes that, that are peppered throughout the book. How That must have been a tough decision because you must have tons of them. It was, as I was writing the story, there, there was always one distinct memory, you know, of that time period. Like going to my Bubby Mary's house, like there was no question but that I had to include like her arugula and her brisket. Going to my grandmother Beauty's, there was no question. I, it had to be about her chicken soup and her potato latkes. Um, Going to my Aunt Jeannie's, there was, like, no question, like, the time, you know, we were snowed in, and my sister was about to be born, and we couldn't get to the hospital, and I was so upset, and we made a, you know, we, she, like, we passed the time making a strudel, which she would, like, roll paper thin, and she'd read the love letters from all her boyfriends through there. So every recipe had, like, such a distinct memory. Was it, when, as you wrote this thing, mm-hmm. was it, were there stories that you thought, oh, I'm stretching the envelope if I share that one or not? Did you have to, yeah, I'm sure you use a little bit of there, discretion on certain things. There's a lot of things I left out. <laughs> it would have been a much longer book. There was a lot of things I, I left, I left out. It's still, it's pretty PG. So when you, so let's shift away for just a second. Let's uh-huh. talk about your work as you travel around the country as a, as a nutritionist and you talk to people about health and food what uh how are, how are we faring out there in america are we getting a little bit healthier in our choices ah uh, god you know i was just in montreal doing a lecture last night and everybody wants to know i mean just as my father wanted to know in the 70s what is the trend what is the miracle and my you know my first response to it is there is no miracle you know people are like well if i cut out gluten am i going to be thin i'm like again there is no miracle everybody is different um, so are we, we're becoming more conscious. Yes. I don't know if we've really come that far since the, you know, from the fifties. I mean, now there's a huge food movement, which is good, but in, the schools are still, you know, struggling to feed kids. Kids eat so much processed food. There's so many like food additives and, and colorings and stuff that are really toxic to our kids. Um, so as my dad would say, We've come, you've come a long way, baby, but not far enough. You know, there's still a lot of work to do. Right. Well, so here's the next question is, you've, now you've done the book, you've got your blog going, you've got the work that you do with nutrition and all that. What's next for Don Lerman? Um, I think I'm going to keep doing the same thing. I mean, my original love is working with kids. Um, I love working with kids, like, especially I work up in Harlem a lot. And I'll walk into a school and I'll show an avocado. Do you know what this is? No. Have you ever had guacamole? Yeah, we've had guacamole at Taco Bell. Do you think if we cut this open and we make guacamole, you'll eat it? No, we're not going to eat that. I'm like, okay, but we'll make it. You don't have to eat it. And then we make it and I make it fun. And we put like pineapples and mangoes in it. And by the end, everyone is like eating like guacamole. And then we'll make kale chips and everyone is loving it. And so, like, the look on kids' faces and transforming the way kids feel about different fruits and vegetables and knowing, like, processed foods are really not going to nur- nourish us, but real foods, you know, are, is, is what I love to do. I love to work with kids and teach them about new things that maybe they wouldn't have, other, you know, otherwise had the experience of. 
Well, as we start to kind of head into the holidays here, what uh, you got any advice here in either food preparation or how we ought to be thinking about the various holiday turkeys and all the various things that that end up on a holiday table? Well, you know, people ask me that all the time, and, and I think it's not what you do one day a week. If you eat, if you go to your mother's house and she's worked all day making turkey and stuffing and all kinds of pies, enjoy it. And then the rest of the year, try and eat healthy. It's not what we do one day. You know, like juice fasts are really big. People are like, oh, what if I do a juice fast for five days? Am I going to be really healthy? I'm like, no, it's not what you do one day or five days. It's what you do every day. So if you try and make one little change every day, like every day, try and add a new fruit or vegetable to your diet. Every day, try and eliminate something processed, you know, and drink and take out soda and drink more water. You know, it's the little things that add up that make a difference. Well, So on the holidays, really enjoy and really, you know, love being with the people you're with and, you know, cook with your kids and create memories. Well, it is one of those never-ending, never-ending subjects with thousands and thousands <laughs> of takes on it. Don Lerman has her take on it. The work is called My Fat Dad, a memoir, a loving memoir of food, love, and family with, with recipes, for sure. Uh, and it's published by Penguin. Uh, Don, how can people find out more about the blog work you do as well as get a copy of the book? Uh, you can buy a copy of the book on Amazon, on barnesandnobles.com. It's in pretty much all the bookstores. It's definitely in all the Barnes and & Nobles. And if, it's, if you're in a small town and you don't have a Barnes & Nobles, your local bookstore will order it. But you can just go online. My website is dawnlerman.net. And you can find me on the WOW blog of the New York Times, Dawn Lerman. Um, and I share my stories there. And I just want to leave with one little quote. This is a quote from Ray Romano, who uh, blurbed the front cover of my book. Whether you're Italian, Jewish, or anything else, you can relate to how family, food, and the love of both affect how we grow up and lives our, lives our lives, manja. And I think that's really important because food should be enjoyed, and food nourishes us. And so I think it, it also brings us together, and we all eat, so it should be something that's enjoyable, and it shouldn't be about just diet and deprivation. It should be about adding new wonderful foods to your diet that, you know, that are healthier because they're home home cooked beautifully said hey don thank you so much for spending part of your day with us good luck with the book and uh thank you so much how wonderful to write for the new york times and write a blog in new york city it's got you got to be loving it <laughs> thank you so much it's fun it's fun i hope people read it and enjoy it and start cooking my recipes and some of their own recipes because everybody has a memoir in them everyone has a story everyone has a food story and everyone should kind of find out the most important recipes from like their heritage and kind of pass them on to our kids you bet we will be back with more right after this on lewis at large